was moving around. Yeah, so it was basically a complete end-to-end -end, uh, integration which uh, was done there. And uh, so you could see only a red light when a robot had an issue. And then this robot would would actually call the respective engineer for help. And the robot would know exactly which engineer can help it. Yeah. So by, by the skill profile that is stored there, right? And then also the engineer would come and probably uh, then have only the user menu he or she can really use in this moment. So it's also a new way of human machine interaction in these kind of scenarios where um, the machines actually give the first call and they also call the right person, human being to help if there's a, if, a, if there's a larger problem. Um, so overall, I would say that um, we have those examples of excellent factories, but, and, and let's say talking about the manufacturing side of industry 4.0 and also on supply chain also across Asia. And there are multiple um, uh, use cases there that have been proven to work, but there's still a long way to go uh, specifically on the integration of data, of technology, um, and also machines in the end. Um, and here we need more standards, there's no doubt. Uh, we are lacking standards, we are lacking also cross-border data standards, and also we need a similar kind of cybersecurity. I leave it for that and try also to get my camera working meanwhile. Great, thank you. That's a very valuable perspective indeed. Uh, Mr. Tyagarajan, let me come to you uh, next for the India perspective on this uh, topic. Thank you, Sunanta. Uh, it's a wonderful question. Um, India is at crossroads at this point of time post pandemic with uh, a self reliant India mission launched by the Prime Minister. We want to position ourselves as the next destination for manufacturing or what they call it China plus one strategy. In that context, uh, we do not have scale like China. Our cost of capital is very high. And if we want to compete, uh, there are two, three things that we need to do. The first one is we need to innovate. Second is cycle time reduction from the concept to launch of a product or identifying the right markets and to figure out what are the other revenue streams which we can augment I think uh, it is only through uh, Industry 4.0 you can achieve this. At this point of time, it looks distant uh, for the simple reason people have made a beginning somewhere. As Klaus mentioned, it is a question of integrating everything and getting it right. Once we get it right, we will be positioning ourselves as the leaders. At this juncture, I think who have made significant uh, um, significant progress may be succeeding than those who are yet to begin. So it is a question of getting it right and positioning yourself at great speed. Uh, like BCG called it, I think, as printing to Industry 4.0. Uh, that's about, that the topic also talks about implanting for the future. Uh, so it is very much relevant in this context of uh, positioning India as the next destination for manufacturing absolutely sprinting to industry 4.0 so uh, valuable points indeed so shinsan let me come to you uh, next and uh, tell me about how japan is uh, you know what japan's perspective on uh, industry 4.0 is yes um i i think that industry 4.0 is still a long way to go for japanese manufacturers uh, probably the most advanced uh, sector is automotive. And, um, you know, after the break of COVID-19, uh, companies like Toyota, Nissan, they have, they suffered so much because of this disconnect between the cyberspace and physical space, particularly in the uh, supply chain. The, what I mean is that, you know, they have manufacturing sites in many locations and they have uh, part suppliers everywhere, particularly from China. They could not 
uh, get the import of uh, parts. So they had to stop manufacturing the uh, automo automotives. So, uh, you know, there are still not so many companies who have fully implemented Industry 4.0 in Japan, but even those who have started doing so uh, could not take a good advantage of it. They were able to see where they are so that they could see the status of uh, where they are, but they couldn't get the remedy uh, on the physical side of it. That's my perspective. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Dr. Lee, uh, China seems to have already kind of won its battle uh, against uh, COVID. But uh, do you uh, do tell us how uh, or what the perspective, how the country, you know, the realizations that came about with the pandemic and how uh, they are uh, translating into accelerated industry 4.0? Uh, thank you. Um, in Suzhou, that's about a uh, half an hour train ride from where class is uh, in Shanghai. And uh, <laughs> uh, we, we do see a lot of uh, uh, uptake in Industrial 4.0 activities in during this year uh, in particular. And I, I want to stress on three changing perspective, what we see from across the spectrum, from um, uh, traditional manufacturer to much advanced ones that uh, class has mentioned uh, the one number one is the change in perspective of digital system is not only a information system but will be a major essential workforce for the company uh, before that in the last few years when we talk uh, 4.0 to the customer they will ask if i, I invest one million rmb how how soon i'm going to get the investment back uh, now the perspective is we're going to invest continuously to build our digital workforce to help our employees uh, to to make better decisions. So there may be many information systems, but there will be only one enterprise digital system uh, each company can build. The second perspective is the change in business model that uh, leading enterprise are seeking. Uh, it's no longer be a vendor buyer situation. So they, they will build a long-term trust relationship with the digital uh, uh, service providers because digital system is going to evolve over the years. It's not going to be one-time system delivery. So people are building that together. I think this trend is uh, in the same way as what we see with uh, uh, global trend. And the third one where class has mentioned uh, is the lack of standards. Um, uh, we have seen multiple projects coming up from leading enterprise to start doing their digital uh, data governance, data uh, management, data quality projects, established data structures, uh, architectures uh, across the, their companies. So these are the activities uh, is happening right now in China. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Peter, let me come to you next. Uh, I particularly wanted to ask you, how does uh, the APAC in the adoption of Industry 4.0 compare with the more mature European uh, countries? I know you have experience in uh, both the regions, so uh, this question particularly, I think uh, you will have some very interesting perspective. Thank you, Sinada. I think... Um Talking about Industry 4.0, it's still a long way to go worldwide. And uh, um, if Shinito-san says that the automotive industry still has a long way to go, then it is really a long way to go. <laughs> um, looking at, um, at uh, Europe and, and Asia, and here we have these two competing countries uh, like Germany and, um, and Japan in the automotive industry, most probably the most advanced ones. Uh, in my business, I'm in a mining business, mining and mineral processing business. It's, um, it's a quite basic industry. We blast rock, we grind it. It's similar like uh, the cement industry, high economies of scale. Um, used to be very labor intensive. My company I'm working for is 130 years old, still family business, $4 billion uh, sales. 
We have 180 factories worldwide. The business started in Europe, um, it developed further in the US, and came to Asia Pacific quite late, probably the first plants being built 30 years ago. And you can see the difference. You can see the difference between the European plants and the Asia Pacific plants. As I said, I've built in the last uh, um, close to 10 years, 25 factories in Asia, and they're all fully automated. So what we have started in Asia, we came from scratch, um, modern, new technologies, very lean. Um, the European plants are mainly um, off-site plants, um, getting old, um, a lot of manual stuff, not integrated in logistics, very big, of course, uh, high volumes. Uh, we have developed in Asia Pacific onsite plants. We went with our factories into our customer plants. So we are integrated in the full supply chain directly to our customers. And with a recent implementation of SAP in Asia Pacific, which went super good and very fast, everybody who has done it, and class probably can comment on this, not so easy. Um, the, the hunger for, for, for this technology and for the digitalization in Asia is much, much, much higher than in Europe. And I compare it when I go to the board meetings. I have sometimes the feeling that in Europe, people are getting complacent. They just uh, sit on what they have developed a long time ago, which was good. And it's definitely a great platform for what we are now um, adapting and improving, actually, in Asia Pacific. So the growth, the speed uh, in particular, is definitely in Asia Pacific. Um, in Asia Pacific, of course, we also have different countries, and we'll come to this topic later on again, I guess. Um, running Asia Pacific from New Zealand to Pakistan, you can imagine, we have developing countries and we have uh, more um, countries which are uh, already similar like Europe, Australia, down under, very slow, uh, very difficult, change management, super difficult. We saw that with our SAP implementation. The Europeans didn't believe it. They thought uh, Australia is a piece of cake. It was not. It was the most difficult country for SAP implementation. China, very easy. India, super good. Virtual. Even South Korea was good. People have more discipline, work harder, and uh, they are, again, more hungry for technology, Adaption is, is super good. I'm, I'm very positive of Asia Pacific and the statistics confirm this one as well. Awesome. Very interesting indeed. And I wish we had a panelist who was based out of uh, Australia. I would have liked to hear uh, his perspective or her <laughs> perspective on this. But uh, very interesting indeed. And uh, let me now come to the financial implication of Industry 4.0. And uh, uh, Mr. Thyagarajan, you in your opening comments mentioned, uh, you know, you talked about uh, the high interest rates prevailing in India. Now, the uh, the great advantage of, uh, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't require the significant investment capital expenditure that the third industrial revolution required. Having said that, companies have to invest in plugging their existing machines into new cyber physical systems that are at the heart of industry 4.0. So, you know, with India as a, a test case, particularly, and with high interest rates prevailing in India, does the investment in uh, technology really pay back? And if so, what is the business case? Thank you, Sinanta. I am particularly very happy. We all know each other through this uh, event, uh, but there is similarity and alignment in our uh, thoughts, actually. That is uh, very encouraging. Uh, now, um, I think uh, b b before actually coming to investing, uh, I India, India uh, should learn one thing. Uh, I don't think Industry 4.0 can be CEO style. Uh, you have to really figure out whether there is a business case and fragmented implementation will never give you revenue or profitability or growth. Uh, so you need to figure out what is right for you and it should form part of the corporate strategy itself. It is not a manufacturing manager's agenda. 
and uh, therefore whether it is it, it should encompass everything business strategy tcm tqm lean most manufacturing excellence and the extended organization like vendors or franchises marketing in fact marketing 4.0 also should get embedded into this whole thing then only it will now um, if you look at it holistically then you figure out whether it is providing the return i am of the view it will happen because i, I my experience is i i grew up in the era of slide rules actually and as a student from slide rule to a casio calculator the investment is very high from typewriter to computer and uh, every time when we implemented sap we found it is not going to pay back it is a huge investment uh, like that so but but at some point of a time you will realize in hindsight it is the thing that i did right now i i would i also have uh, yeah, yeah suggestion to the marketing uh, people the uh, digital technologies are sold as if it is going to pay back and i think it is oversold is my experience it is it is better to fast forward and arrive at when and how it will pay back quite often payback is not happening because of a i told you fragmented implementation two is the uh, the data discipline you 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 have not integrated it completely and you have not identified the new revenue stream say for example uh, in a, in a cold storage uh, solution uh, with a vaccination program uh, that is going to unfold unless and until i have the customer data everywhere and i know the usage patterns then i can remote monitoring solutions uh, i can under the ice cream segment we have figured out the the deep freezer usage at various places how often they open the door what is the temperature being maintained something else is put inside so in order to serve my customer better unless and until i have the complete data architecture right i will never be able to and lastly one one thought for indian companies i am of the view you should look at the reconditioned refurbished uh, equipment and solutions as well that market is developing a country like india will benefit by creating that ecosystem where you can get the re- machines that are used refurbish it and use it there is a great potential for that thank you excellent excellent so uh, peter i wanted to particularly ask you about the cost of the workforce in uh, you know and how that is impacting the adoption of uh, 4.0 so you know uh, the cost of workforce is getting more expensive in the developed countries asian countries it's especially uh, is this uh, nudging startups to turn towards the implementing uh, of digitalization associated with industry 4.0 well this um, there's always a, a pressure i mean the business has a pnl and a balance sheet and you have to look uh, how to compete um if you if you see the different countries how they developed um um we have the differences in 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 economies like the singapore australia korea japan uh, and in the meantime definitely also china and you have the other still developing countries like uh, vietnam indonesia lao cambodia on still a very kind of low cost basis but if you see the developments over the last 10 15 20 years and take the example of china which is one of the the largest economy in the world um i've been in china 1987 88 starting to look uh, people still um working really remote um no digitalization everything was handcraft um and today uh, we still have a lot of competitors we have about 1000 competitors in china the highest in the world probably and probably 90% of those competitors who are still on a manual base they will disappear uh we have started um to implement digitalization uh, automation plc systems in our robots in in the machinery right from the beginning and we lost a lot of money we lost a lot of money on the pnl because we couldn't compete with a cheap workforce and uh, not compliance in sustainability and uh, uh, and um, economy uh, uh, with with other competitors and now china is changing employment is getting more expensive the east coast of china 
you go to Shanghai, even down to, to Guangzhou, um, the cost of employment is probably similar to like the European cost in the meantime. So people have to out, uh, go into automatization or they have to leave the area. So they move more to Chengdu area in the center or they go to Vietnam for manufacturing for low cost products, especially in the textile industry. But for us, we clearly um, increasing our revenues, we increasing our profits by having implemented the digitalization right from the beginning. And now you, most of the competitors cannot compete anymore. Fantastic. So, so you have reaped the benefits of uh, digitalization. Yes, this is definitely a part and it is a trend. This is a trend in Asia Pacific going from country to country. As further the countries are developing, only people are competitive who are really in digitalization in, you can call it in a 3.4, which is still a long way to go, but, but uh, it is definitely a huge advantage. And, um, and I see here in the adaptation in Asia Pacific tremendous and it's really going fast. And, um, and um, again, I think Europe is more complacent and we will also manufacturing wise um, compete with other countries out of Asia a lot. One belt, one road is one part we have to discuss in another forum, I guess. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Peter, for your uh, views on that. Uh, let me come to uh, Shinsan. Uh, the Japanese government, uh, Shinsan, has launched uh, an initiative called the Society 5.0. Now, how does this leverage Industry 4.0? Are there any synergies? Uh, what are the cost implications? Do tell us a little more about this. Yes, uh, Society 5.0 was set forth by the um, Prime Minister's Cabinet Office some time ago, and it is a vision based on the issues that we see uh, on the social level that you know, we are having, we are experiencing a very fast reduction in population particularly the younger ones, we, the proportion of our elderly is increasing. Uh, that means less people uh, in the workforce. And at the same time, the lifetime, lifespan is expanding to a uh, hundred years. So what do you do about that? And the vision that came up is this Society 5.0. And I believe that Industry 4.0 was um, initially created around 2015 in Germany. And uh, Japan uh, created something similar in 2017 called Connected Industries. Now, this uh, Society 5.0 is an expansion uh, that covers not only manufacturing, but um, many other things, uh, such as healthcare, elderly care, agriculture, food loss, and so forth, that SDGs uh, address um, many of these things. And um, in terms of the relationship between Industry 4.0 and Society 5.0, Industry 4.0 is sort of contained, but uh, Society 5.0 uh, covers much broader. Um, now, 5.0 is based on 4.0, and Society 4.0 is the society that we currently live, where you no know, people seek information in, in on the internet and get some information and analyze and evaluate and see how they should be using such information. Now, in industry, uh, the Society 5.0 is a little bit more intelligent. So that cyberspace uh, has this AI that understands how the physical uh, world is um, moving and uh, so that they do a certain um, analysis on, on, on understanding the concept, context and tries to act upon 
us that benefits uh, our being. So, you know, it's a little bit more uh, proactive and uh, is going to be a service for us. In terms of uh, financial costs, because of this, you know, uh, wide variety of services it can provide, I think there will be some economies of scope so that looking at the manufacturing aspect of uh, things, it will be cost reduced. And um, also this AI, because it collects so much data, it can learn much more quickly and it's going to be a robust brain for us. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, we don't have much time left as uh, the, uh, the ticker in the screen is telling me. Uh, so let me try and quickly, uh, you know, get uh, some perspective on uh, the, uh, the balance between automation and human capital. You know, while machine learning, AI, big data, etc., pillars of Industry 4.0, uh, the core of every organization is the people who work there. Now, the constant concern with the uh, automation has been the job losses associated with it. So, uh, Tyag, I'd like to start with you. In a country like India, where labor costs are relatively uh, lower, unemployment is very high, how do you strike the right balance between automation and uh, the social concerns? Uh, thank you, Sunanta. Uh, the, if you uh, look back uh, in the history, I don't think with any automation or uh, digitalization, jobs have been lost at all. Well, let, let's say horse carriage to automobile or computing. Uh, let's say even in uh, Industry 4.0, automated guided vehicle, for example, instead of somebody driving a forklift truck, uh, I think the jobs are going to be different. So the reskilling is an agenda that we should embrace very fast, keeping the future in mind. Therefore, how academia will reinvent itself to be providing it, even, even at a IIT level, how we can train the people, guide the people. And uh, my disappointment with the country is there is no structured career counseling at all, even at the white collar level. So blue collar level, how you get there. So I think national skill mission should focus on that. And the second is uh, it depends on the leadership as well. Like I know very well uh, CII is doing, that is Confederation of Indian Industry is doing a very great job in visionary leaders for manufacturing. Actually, we have manufacturing leaders as a shortage. You may have engineers, but uh, leaders. The uh, other one is how the boards will get uh, real manufacturing experts also part of the board. So uh, it will be generally dominated, um, in my experience, by the marketing guys or by the governance guys or the finance guys. So the manufacturing uh, is one uh, leadership requirement at the board level itself. Uh, I think uh, the jobs, more jobs will be created if we grow faster. Uh, in the history, I have not come across jobs being lost from generation to generation. It's a different job. You have to prepare yourself. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Lee, uh, China has made itself a manufacturing hub. How do manufacturing units in uh, China strike this balance? Yes, I, I think I uh, concur with uh, uh, earlier comments on this. Is the digitalization system is actually helping the workers, uh, providing the information at a faster speed. So everyone will not only be doing their work, but also be provider of critical data. So employees will be data consumers and data providers. They are responsible for the health and accuracy of the digital system. Uh, so we also believe that there will be more job created uh, with the digital system implemented. Awesome, thank you. And. Uh well, we have about 55 seconds left, and I did have a host of uh, other questions, but uh, a quick perspective uh, for any uh, anyone of who, you who would like to, uh, you know, give his perspective. What will bring Industry 4.0 to life in APAC? 
Peter, why don't we start with you? On the skill side, um, yeah, I think it's it's basically uh, training is one of the most important parts. Um, using the the young talents, uh, we have a extremely young population in Asia Pacific. Uh, I think sixty um, percent in Indonesia are below twenty eight. It's amazing. Um, all those uh, kids uh, need education. Um, I think the governments have responsibilities. Uh, to give them access to to education, and I think important here is um, that they they um, spend also the money into the digital world of of um, of education. Um, and I'm sure, and uh, for the for the part of India, we know it's already really really going well. I think uh, the Indian young generation is adapting very, very well to, to digitalization, same in China. And um, and they work hard and the kids are very smart. So I think, yes, um, education, um, in particular for the young youngsters to come up for the next generation. And we will see in the next 10, 15 years, a huge increase um, of uh, leading, leading of technology, uh, digitalization coming out of Asia. I wouldn't say that Europe is,